So guys, after 146 days, a tentative agreement to end the writer's strike has been made. So in this video, I was going to kind of do a news roundup, even though I do have a topic at the end that I want to get to more about that in a second. What I want to do in this video is cover what this means now that we have a tentative agreement with the WGA and the AMPTP finally getting to something there after all of this time. How things will unfold from this point onwards, as I'm seeing a lot of people out there on social media saying, or thinking that productions can just start up again right now when that's not really the case at all. I also want to just kind of get into what this means for when writers can get back to work, when they can start actually developing those scripts again. Then, of course, the actor's strike. When could that resolve now that the WGA have come to this deal? With both of those things combined together, what does this mean for your favorite movies, TV shows, and in general, just productions out there? And also, even with the resolution of both WGA and SAG after in the future, there is, believe it or not, and I'm not trying to scare people, I just am trying to keep people informed, there are more agreements expiring next year that could potentially, potentially cause even further disruptions to the industry if those unions went on to strike. So we're going to get into that at the tip tail of the WGA sag after talk. But also, as I said and teased a minute ago, I also want to cover some news that I missed in how we also have a major DC Studios update with huge investment from Warner Brothers Discovery and, and what this means for the future of DC movies. Let's go from the top with what Deadline had to say. The Writers Guild has reached a tentative agreement with the Alliance of Motion Pictures Picture and television producers to end its strike after nearly five months. The parties finalized the framework of the deal Sunday when they were able to untangle their stalemate over AI and writing room staffing levels. Now they go on to say that the details of the WJ's tentative agreement haven't been released but will be revealed by the guild in advance of the membership's ratification votes. So having said that, even though we don't know how much of a good deal the WGA got, even though from where I'm standing and what I've been observing this whole time, they weren't stopping, hence the five months, until they got a good deal. They have said in their statement that we can say with great pride that this deal is exceptional, with meaningful gains and protections for writers in every sector of the membership. So what I want to get to now is what is next? Can they start putting pen to paper right now? If they can't, when can they? Uh, because, you know, again, I've, I've had people tweet me saying, productions can start right now. No, I'm not trying to be a party pooper. I, I'm just trying to set in what is really going on right now from what I have gathered. So, given that the WGA has come to a deal with the AMPTP, granted it's a tentative one, what happens next is that there is a vote that is going to take place because technically the deal, if you will, isn't official until those from the WGA West Board and the WGA East Council give their endorsement slash approval after reviewing it, which is scheduled for Tuesday. Once that is done, guys, there is yet another vote. So the board and council would then vote on whether to authorize a contract ratification vote by the membership of those in the WGA, who will then have, I think, around a couple of weeks until that approval occurs if the vote, you know, is in favor of the deal. So there will be meetings where members, writers of the WGA will have the opportunity to learn more about the deal before voting on it. But, you know, you would have to think if the heads, the negotiators of the WGA were somewhat happy with this deal and they're calling it exceptional, it is more or less likely, in my opinion, that the, the members of the WGA will vote to approve this as well. And then finally, with that being said and done, if it's all good to go, there'll be another vote on whether to lift the restraining order and somewhat, you know, announce the end of the strike at a certain date officially while the ratification vote by the membership is taking place. So technically there is like an inbuilt thing and where there is still the power for the vote from the members of the WGA to say no to the deal. But again, 
that is very unlikely. But let's look into a little bit more. When can they actually start developing scripts again, start working on them? Because as always, I'll use the example here of something like the Batman part two. Uh, you know, Matt Reeves, from what I understand and through what he said in many interviews out there, they're not actually technically done. He's always like me and my partner, Mattson Tomlin, are still writing the script. So can he start writing it right now? Well, as of right this very second, no, you're not allowed to. Deadline said this about what happened during the WGA and AMPTP meeting. The studios also inquired if once a tentative agreement is ratified by the scribes, if the writers would pick up their pens and hit their keyboards again very soon afterwards. The Guild, from what we understand, had made the request that their members not to return to work until SAG AFTRA also had a new agreement with the AMPTP, reflective of the WGA's feeling of solidarity between the two unions that has characterized their first mutual strike since 1960. It seems a pathway to split the difference was found. So I think this is what is confusing quite a few people out there. People are interpreting what's being said as the WGA will not be developing or writing or resuming work basically until SAG-AFTRA have their deal. But given what Deadline just said there, especially at the latter of what they just said, on top of when you combine it with this section from the WGA's message last night in where they say, if that authorization is approved, the board and council would also vote on whether to lift the restraining order and end the strike at a certain date and time to be determined, pending ratification. This would allow writers to return to work during the ratification vote, but would not affect the membership's right to make a final determination on contract approval. So yeah, all while the WGA still obviously encouraged standing in solidarity with SAG-AFTRA in the sense of supporting and continuing to pick it with them if the writers are able to do so, it is still their goal so it seems to possibly return to work as soon as the ratification vote is underway, where once again, that is when the members members of the WGA are voting in favor or not of the deal that has been brought forward to them. And where, again, given that the leadership are happy with the deal that they got, they're calling it exceptional. I don't see why after five long months, writers would be like, now nah, let's reject that deal. And God, cause all of this uh, fallout where imagine how that would affect things where the studios would be like, eh, we're going to have to start negotiating again and where they probably wouldn't want to immediately it would just yeah so in my opinion it's all formalities this is just the process we have to go through in the next couple of weeks or so but during that voting process it is important to note that there can be work conducted by writers during the ratification vote which leads me to after all of those processes the bottom line is while we wait for the deal to become sealed and official with the wga with all of the things we just talked about the companies will now likely turn their heads to that of SAG-AFTRA because it's not like uh, the AMPTP are just going to be like, ah, we've done the WGA thing, let's just take a breather. Now, I think that with the stress of them now finally from Wednesday to Sunday negotiating with the WGA after five months, showing how desperate they are and you know how David Zaslav, WBD, are saying they've lost 300 to 500 million because of these strikes. They want this done. So now they're going to go to the actors because you can't really start production without bloody actors. And they're going to be like, okay, let's now quickly turn to them. But now you may be asking, okay, so what is the deal with the SAG-AFTRA strikes? What are they somewhat looking for? Will this be as, well, I, I was about to say smooth sailing as the WGA, but that has not been smooth sailing. It's been five months. But what I'm trying to say is, will it be, I guess, expedited as Wednesday to Sunday, like what we just experienced with the WGA and the AMPTP? Will we get like another four or five day period from right now? To, to finishing it, and then it would be truly, truly over. Well, from what I understand, a lot of the SAG after demands are somewhat similar to what the WGA were seeking in their contract deal with actually even Brian Cranston recently saying, we have some slight different issues than the Writers Guild has, but for the most part, I would say 75 to 80% of their issues are 
are issues as well. And that is important to note because, again, with the somewhat massive progress of the AMPTP and the WGA coming to this tentative agreement for this new contract deal, it does naturally somewhat infer that there could be a bit of a smoother process for SAG-AFTRA given, for example, what Brian Cranston just said, if they have a lot of similar requirements. But SAG-AFTRA are quite concerned about some other things that may prove a little bit, you know, like the AMPTP might be like, you know, I don't know about that. And I'm not saying it's going to be a rocky road, but as Brian Cranston just said, for example, not everything is identical. So they're concerned about wage as well as residuals and AI, just like the writers. But there's other things that will need to be negotiated, such as the actors are really concerned about pension, also the ability to even qualify for health insurance. That's been a big thing. For example, I believe the threshold is like 26,000 and something dollars. And I believe around 80% of SAG after members, believe it or not, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, don't even make that amount of money to qualify for health insurance. So there's stuff there that they really, really want to figure out. Now, there are other things that does separate SAG-AFTRA's requirements for their deal compared to the WGA, such as, for example, Park News is reporting that SAG-AFTRA wants an 11% increase in basic wages, whereas the WGA asked for a 6% increase. And they definitely wouldn't want uh, a number nor would likely even agree to a number as far down as 6%. So once again, even though a lot of things set forth from the WGA tentative agreement will help expedite the SAG-AFTRA negotiations, there's things like this where, as I've already briefly gone over, where the AMPTP might be a bit like, Yeah, but hopefully that won't cause massive problems or complications that create this huge lull that even though the WGA deal will likely be completely agreed upon, sag after could go on for the next several months. Like, I, I really don't think so because as I'm tr really trying to emphasize in this video, the studios and streamers really <laughs> want to get back to shooting. That's evident after five months of WGA strikes and now SAG striking since July. They're not going to just have the writers get back to work and neglect the actors for months on end. They need the actors to get the productions back into play. It's just that these negotiations with SAG-AFTRA could still take a little bit of time, not months or anything. I I'm really not saying that at all. It's just I'm not saying either that it will necessarily be done by next Thursday. Uh, it, it could be, it could honestly be like a couple of weeks or it could be a little bit longer before they also reach their tentative agreement. And then, of course, as per what I just set out at the beginning of this video, SAG-AFTRA would then have the, the period of the, this voting for approval and then it's put towards the union members and their approval and then you announce the lift of the restraining order and so that the strike can end, if you know what I mean. So all in all there, hopefully not too long from now, perhaps even by the end of October or hopefully before, this could all be resolved and quite literally loads upon loads and loads of productions would be booting up again. So that is the gist of what's happened with the WGA, how fantastic it is. We finally got to this point, but now how things don't necessarily go back to normal right away, but hopefully not too long. And also what could be happening with SAG-AFTRA, hopefully swiftly following suit with what's happened with the WGA and the AMPTP. But I did also tease that there could be some extra disruptions to the industry next year. So despite everything I've just said, and again, I don't want to put fear out there. I'm just saying bookmark this as a potential thing that could cause some things. But I am choosing to be very optimistic about this. And we'll get into that in just a second. Next year, more contracts are expiring. So as reported by Puck News once again, shout out to them. The SAG after a net code, such as reality shows, talk shows, late night nights, soaps, also the Teamsters truck drivers agreement, which is a big one, but also another whopping one is that of the IATSE crew union agreements, which stands for the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. So essentially the union behind the entertainment, the live events, motion pictures, wardrobe, broadcast, essentially the crew that makes 
that the film production even happened in the first place. So as you can imagine, if they opted to strike like the WGA did, like sag after did, because the AMPTP were not before that giving them a fair enough deal provisionally so what do you then go on to do you then opt to strike to basically be like f you we're going to disrupt things so we can actually get something better this would once again completely shut down the industry because even though writers and actors would be geared up and ready to go you you can't shoot a movie without the people who are making the moving pieces literally happen but here's my optimistic take here with the disruption of 2023 because for me it's gone by very very quickly but don't forget that the writers the wga have been on strike since may then of course sag after striking since july because of all of that i'm encouraged in thinking that maybe the amptp will not want even more major disruptions to getting back on track in 2024 so so hopefully they agree to a deal that avoids these unions opting to strike because as i've heavily gone over they've already transparently been sweating a little bit now they're just really wanting to get things back to normal imagine if just as let's just say the batman part two goes into production next year in march as per what it's been delayed to eventually they, they, they start shooting another movie starts shooting as the year unfolds but then there's another massive industry standstill because you have big unions that make those movies happen that are totally outside of the actors and writers going on strike as well i you would hope that as per the usual process they start talking before then and the amptp to avoid them opting strike will be like okay what about this and they'll be like okay okay we, we won't strike then we can just carry on with a new contract that we're happy with now don't get me wrong with the amptp nothing would surprise me at this point but hopefully you would you would have thought by the, by the time those contracts expire that they've learned their lesson. This also means that whatever is going to be cooked up in the next couple of weeks with SAG-AFTRA in those negotiations, that will therefore somewhat drive the demands from these unions next year. So hopefully that doesn't cause any friction between SAG-AFTRA and what will be happening very soon. Um, and we're just going to have to wait and see. But no matter what, guys, major, 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 major progress. And again, hopefully before Halloween, in my opinion, things will be going back to normal. There will be a bit of a lull period in certain things, but you're going to have like a bunch of things happening at once. So let me know what you thought of my ramble of everything that is actually happening right now. Let me know if it informed you, because again, I'm seeing a lot of people kind of assume things that Really, it doesn't pertain to the process of what is actually unfolding. But that doesn't mean that those things that people are really excited for, such as, you know, getting back to normal again, it doesn't mean that they're not too far away. So let me know what you think of that. And lastly, I wanted to talk about DC Studios because there's been quite a big update. Now, some of you may be like, eh, is it really that big? It kind of is a big deal with regards to the faith, the investment, and the belief <laughs> and and the requirement if we're if we're going to be frank here of how dc has to perform in the future and what warner brothers discovery is willing to do to make that happen so this came out quite a few days ago now but deadline reported as well as many other outlets that uk's leavesden production facility to become dc studios hub by 2027 as part of major Warner Brothers Discovery expansion. So they go on to say here, Warner Brothers Discovery has confirmed it plans a major expansion of its Leavesden studio lot with the UK location set to become the epicenter of DC Studios production. Now, obviously, uh, Leavesden is owned by Warner Brothers already. As they go on to say here, the, the, the media company has spent the past year in cost-cutting mode, delivering $4 billion in cost savings. And I think, you know, we've reported on that enough and spoken about that with all the cost-cutting that Warner Brothers and David Zaslav have heavily been doing in the past year or so. But they plan to call for 10, this is like huge, 10 new sound stages and 400 thousand new square feet of production and support space according to a press release the growth surge will increase the production capacity in leavesden by more than 50 percent the total stage count will rise from 19 to 29 and the overall production space from 1.14 million square feet to 1.78 million square feet so this is big because you know obviously uh you know they're, they're talking about that to hopefully fully be wrapped up uh and you know work is slated you know in the second 
second quarter of 2024 to wrap up in 2027, for then it to really become the primary production hub for DC Studios. Like, Leaves Den is basically got to be known as freaking DC Studios hub in uh, the UK, which is is really cool because obviously uh, this is a few years away with this massive expansion. And that's not to say that, for example, Superman Legacy, like we, we, we don't know this for a fact, but it's likely, depending on where it's going to shoot on location, but they could do things like that at Leavesden. We're going to have other movies in the DCU utilize that space as well. But by 2027, it is going to be retrofitted into a DC Studios powerhouse. So with these expansions, it's interesting to note that deadlines say DC Studios co-chairman and CEOs James Gunn and Peter Safran will consult with the expansion team to ensure their ideas are incorporated into the new studio and production facilities. So James Gunn, having a lot of experience as a director, will have a lot of input in what he wants to include in certain spaces at Leaves Den with this massive, massive upgrade. So maybe there will be a corner for all kinds of flight, where it's like Superman or lanterns in space or, or God knows what there, or like, hey, this is where we're going to set up massive vehicles. This will be the dedicated space. I've come across this technology when I was working on Guardians 3, Guardians 2, or my experience during Peacemaker Season 2 of this has taught me if we introduce this technology here and dedicate this space or this Downstage to that, we can now use all future, I don't know, proper like superhuman flight moments in this section. And we can make it look really good with the latest technology, the latest things that give us the ability to make it the best we possibly could. So I, I'm sure he's going to have like input like that. But the bigger thing here is that it's just so cool to see this happen because, you know, you can still shoot. DC movies like has been done beforehand without this massive upgrade. So this speaks to a larger message of they are going head over heels into the future DCU. And that's a question I get asked a lot. It's like, Boba, do you really think that they're going to like really invest or is, is the DCU not dead on arrival like everyone keeps saying? Technically, that is to be determined, even though I've got like a video cooking up about this. Bit of a preview for that. I don't think the DCU would be dead on arrival unless, for example, Superman Legacy did something like uh, Shazam Fear of the Gods money. So like 136 million. And no matter what, believe it or not, I know there's going to be someone in the comments there. So I don't think that will be the case. Now, don't take that the wrong way. It would still be pretty bad if it still made a few hundred million. Uh, we're going to get into that in another video, but I do believe they wouldn't just necessarily give up there. But what I'm trying to speak to is that their intentions are to make this a flourishing, flourishing franchise that is reignited, not making the same mistakes of studio exec meddling from previous years, and where they're facilitating a primary production hub for DC Studios, further just reinforcing that they are really, really just pouring everything they can into making that future work for the DCU. They know they've got crazy characters that can make them crazy money. Sure, I'm not saying that, hey, Boba, but you, we still need to wait to see the movies, right? They, they could be bad. They could be executed bad. What if they don't do what? Yeah, that's, that's true. But the intention is there to make it like, dude, like they cannot miss. As I've said, and I think everyone is aware right now, they need to slap with it. They, it. It can't not slap. Sure, there may be people who might not be interested in the first place, but if the movie is made well, executed well, crafted well, they just want to start off on that right foot. And a way to do that is also by, you know, envisioning the future in, in, in a way that they can really pull off all of these future plans. Like, you know, by 2027, you'd have things like maybe Swamp Thing happening at Leavesden in London because we've roughly gone over that map that you're seeing on screen right now and from my guesstimation if you will with two TV shows and two movies a year as per Peter Safran saying that uh, roughly around about then you could see Swamp Thing production in Leavesden and, and again not to say that other productions won't be there before then but in terms of like the new proper like upgraded DC Studios hub, Swamp Thing could take advantage of that. And if you've seen any of the behind the scenes of um, Swamp Thing from DC Universe with the sets that they've actually made of the swamp and how incredible that is, but imagine that on an even grander scale, 
that makes me, even if I remove my DC bias aside here, just even as a fan of production, that makes me very excited for the eye candy and, and new techniques and immersive, you know, tools that they can use to bring this world to life. And without doxing myself, let's just say that it, it wouldn't take me too long at all to get to Leavesden. And uh, now I'm thinking, oh man, DC, the home of DC Studios is going to be at Leavesden in uh, London and uh, you know I, I I just want to go up there and sit at the gate and be like hi Mr. David Corrin Sweat uh, can you say something to the subscribers of my channel I don't know but it is really cool knowing that it is uh, just down the road from me so to speak but let me know what you think of this um, it is not like whopping crazy oh my god new character casting news but if you read between the lines this is very promising for DC's future and just you know telling of how much Warner Brothers Discovery really want to make this work, despite what you hearing this right now may think and how much disdain some fans may have for the current brand. The future is aiming, or they are aiming to have it be bright. And this is the mark, like the first carving in the tree that they're trying to show you that they're, they are very serious about it. But enough rambling from me in today's video, guys. Just thank you so much for watching up until this point, if you have got this far. If you have got this far, let me know what you think of everything we discussed down in that comment section. Leave me a like if you enjoyed it. It really does help boost my channel and my videos up there in the algorithm. So please consider doing that. Consider sharing it. Consider subscribing for more content like this. But until next time, thank you so much for watching. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.